Welcome to Simpler Bible, a daily journey to biblical understanding. Today might have some controversy in it. I'm going to do the best I can to avoid it, but don't throw me under the bus for this. So, Lazarus and the rich man, Luke 16. Is it a true story or is it a parable? I don't know. I have thoughts on it. That's it. But I have found through the years that people are really strongly opinionated on whether or not this is a true story or a parable. And I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to try to avoid it. At some point, I'm going to say it's a story. At some point, I'm going to say it's a parable. And uh, and you're going to be mad at me for being opposite of where you are. I'm just telling you, that is not, I have no dog in that fight. I'm not interested. If you want to try to convince me one way or the other, I'm happy to have that conversation. But I've had that conversation a lot of times and I'm still not settled on it. So here we go. Luke 16. I don't think the crux of the text is whether or not the story is an actual story or a parable. I think it's the point of the story that Christ is trying to make. So Luke 16 says this. He also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called to him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in your account of your management for you can no longer be manager. The manager said to himself, what will I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what I will do so that when I am removed from management, people will receive me into their houses. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. He said, Take your bill, sit down, and quickly write 50. So, he's cutting people's bills in half or giving them 40% savings of what they owe the master because the manager of the master's accounts is about to lose his job. And so, he thinks if he cuts everybody's bills in half or cut, gives them savings, that when he gets fired, they'll be like, Oh man, you're a good guy. You can live with me for a little bit until you get back on your feet. So he said to another, how much do you owe? He said, I owe the master a hundred measures of wheat. He says, sit down and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. I tell you, make friends for yourself by the means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it falls, they may receive you, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. The one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. The one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. And then he said, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will trust entrust to you the true riches of the kingdom of heaven? And if you have not been faithful in what that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. We saw this back in Matthew 6. He will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So if you're not faithful in the temporary wealth, how would you ever be regarded to be faithful with the spiritual wealth of the kingdom of heaven? He goes on to say this, the Pharisees who were lovers of money. Now, Chapter 16 bumps up next to chapter 15. He's rebuked the Pharisees in chapter 15. It is a rebuke of the Pharisees, and he is continuing that conversation now. He's continuing to rebuke the Pharisees. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things and ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart, for what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John, that's John the Baptist, since then the good news of the kingdom of heaven is preached, or the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. We'll come back to that in a second. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. So this sounds very much like Matthew 6 now, which was also a rebuke of the Pharisees. So keep that in mind. Um, uh, sorry, let's see. Where did I, I lost my place? Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman who is divorced from her husband also commits adultery. There was a rich man. Who is he talking about? He's rebuking the Pharisees for their love of money. He is criticizing the Pharisees for their love of money. Keep that in mind when we read this story slash parable of the rich man and Lazarus, okay? That's the context here. He's rebuking the Pharisees. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was a poor man named Lazarus covered in sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades, being in torment. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger into the water to cool my tongue, for I'm in anguish here in the flame. So 
You have the rich man who, and who is that referencing here in this context? Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees. You have the poor man, which takes us all the way back to Matthew 5, where blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is what Jesus is addressing. He is addressing the fact that the sinners and the Pharisees, sorry, the sinners and the tax collectors and the prostitutes are coming into grace and coming into the gospel and the Pharisees in their pride and in their pomp and in their circumstance and in their love for wealth are missing the gospel. That's what he's addressing in chapter 15 and in chapter 16. Context. Read it together. Read it as one argument. So uh, the person who is not poor in spirit, the person who is arrogant and who loves their money, which remember, what does he say? You can't serve God and wealth. You can't do both. So the person who's in love with their money ends up in Hades. The poor man ends up in Abraham's bosom or in paradise in the presence of God. And the rich man says, let, let, Abraham, let Lazarus come and dip his finger in the water and cool my tongue. I'm in torment here. Abraham said, child, remember that you in your lifetime received good things and Lazarus in his lifetime, bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. Besides all this, there is fixed between you and us a great chasm in order that the one who would pass from here to you can't and none can cross from there to us. So there's a chasm between those who who serve their money rather than God uh, and those who have served God. There's a chasm fixed. And he said, I beg you then, Father, to send him to my father's house. So he says, send Lazarus back to talk to my brothers. He goes, I have five brothers so that he may warn them so that they won't come to this place of torment. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Okay, go back up here to verse 17. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Matthew chapter 5, um, 17 through 18. I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. All of the law and all of the prophets. prophets. Uh, John chapter 5, where Jesus says, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. But these are they that bear witness about me. So he's saying to the rich man who's like, go and warn my brother. Send Lazarus from the dead to warn my brother so that they won't come to this place of torment. And Abraham goes, they have Moses. They have the prophets. Let them listen to the prophets. Let them listen to Moses. This should make us think also of Luke 24 that we read a few days ago. Beginning with Moses and the prophets. He explained to them how the scriptures uh, pointed to him. He, he opened up their minds to understand the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. So he says, send Lazarus from the dead to proclaim to my brothers the truth so that they won't come to this place. And Abraham's answer is they have Moses and they have the prophets. Let them listen to them. And he said, no, Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said, if they do not listen very carefully to this, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Who is about to rise from the dead? Jesus. If, if the Pharisees don't believe the, the prophets, if the Pharisees don't believe Moses, if the Pharisees aren't willing to believe the scripture, will they even believe when Jesus is raised from the dead? No. They've denied the scripture. They've denied Christ. This is a rebuke against the Pharisees. Okay? And so, rolling on into to Luke 17, he said to the disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostle said to him, Lord, increase our faith. The Lord said, if you had faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. Well, and I love this text. I've loved this one since I was in college. Uh, I wasn't in college anymore. I'd already dropped out, but around that age. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he comes in from the field, come at once and recline at the table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterwards you can eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what he was commanded? So you also, when you've done everything that you were commanded, should say we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. So here's the picture. You have a servant who's working in the field. You have the master of the house in the house and the servant who works in the field comes into the house. The master doesn't say, oh, you've worked hard today. Sit down. Let me feed you. I'll cook dinner tonight. What does the master do? He says, fix me dinner. And the servant fixes dinner. And he, he says, 
Does he thank the servant because he did what he was commanded to do? Does he thank the servant because he was he did what he was supposed to do? And he goes, so you also, when you've done everything you were commanded to do, should say, I'm just an unworthy servant having done my duty. So this again goes to the heart of those Pharisees and the people who are not the Pharisees. The Pharisees are like, look at me, look at what I'm doing. I'm worthy of glory. I'm worthy of honor. Pat me on the back. He goes, no, that's not the heart of a real servant. The heart of the real servant is I'm just a servant. I've just done my duty. You don't owe me a thank you. I've done what I was supposed to do. Do we get praise for doing the thing we were supposed to do? And and I I have loved this text because I hold it in my mind and I try to remember that this ought to be my attitude. It's Philippians 2 all over again. Have this attitude in yourself, which was in Christ Jesus, dot, 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 and be a servant like him. Okay. So on the way to Jerusalem, this is uh, chapter 17, verse 11. He was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance. He lifted up their, who lifted up their voice saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. 10 lepers. When he saw them, he said, go and show yourself to the priest. As they were going, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. But he was a Samaritan. Remember, Samaritans, 2 Kings 17 is where that originates. And this is the inbreeding, This not inbreeding, this is the, uh, this is the mix between the Assyrian people and the Jewish people. Okay, So this is a Samaritan who comes back to thank Jesus. Jesus answers, we're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Meaning, the other nine were Jews. The other nine missed it. And who is coming to Jesus? The Samaritan, the tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes, the people who view themselves as servants, the people who aren't uh, too proud to come in. This is... This is the same picture that he's been saying. This is why the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes are not coming to Jesus because they believe themselves high and mighty and righteous and well. They don't need a doctor. They don't need someone to save them. They don't need someone to make them righteous. That's their belief anyway. He said to him, to this foreigner, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here's the kingdom of God, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is already in your midst. He said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look there or look here, but do not go out and follow them. For as lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so the Son of Man will be in his day. In other words, no one will miss the return of Christ. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, we've talked about this text already, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out of Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So it will be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In other words, Uh, when Christ comes back, there will be people in the world who have not been expecting the return of Christ, who don't care about the return of Christ, and they will be going about their business like it's no big deal. On that day, let the one who is in the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let not the one who is in the field turn back. Remember Lot's wife. She was turned into a pillar of salt back in uh, Genesis 19. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I tell you, in that night, there will be two in bed. One will be taken and one left. There will be two women grinding together, one taken and one left. Again, we talked about this in the book of Matthew. And they said to him, where, Lord? And he said, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. So please try to keep in mind the conversations that Jesus is having. Please try to keep in mind who his audience is. Please try to keep in mind who is sitting down at the table with him and fellowshipping with him and believing in him. And please try to keep in mind the peripheral people, the Pharisees and the scribes who are there to try to trap him and 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 find a means by which to put him to death, who he is uh, systematically rebuking over and over and over. Now, tomorrow, Luke 18. If you're reading ahead, go ahead and read Luke 18, and we will be in that tomorrow. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for joining with us today at Simpler Bible through another section of Scripture where we come to know and understand God a little bit better. Look, if you're brand new to Simpler Bible, we have all sorts of resources available for you. Go to our website, simplerbible.com, and there you can find these videos, you can find our podcast, you can find links to our social media, and you can even find a blog post with additional scriptures if you want to go into a little bit more study than we had time to cover in this podcast and video today. 
We hope that this tool will be exactly that for you, a tool. Not something that replaces your daily walk with God, but something that enhances your daily walk with God and helps you to know and enjoy Him more. Thank you so much for being part of this, and we'll see you again tomorrow.